Call to order the February 1st, 2016 meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board being recorded by ACMI. First on our agenda this evening is a discussion with the Capital Planning Committee about uh, certain buildings in school, including Central School, uh, with Stephen Andrew and Barbara Thornton from the CPC with us this evening uh, as we come forward regarding the front. You can just introduce yourselves and then get right into it. Please. Okay. I'm Barbara Thornton. And I'm Steve Andrew. Thanks and, for And uh, we are here, let me start at the 40,000 foot level and say we're here because we're representing a fellow committee, the Arlington Capital Planning Committee. I have not ever been before you before. We don't talk, we don't meet, and it just seems sort of silly. And it particularly seems silly this year when we were reviewing the long-term status of, of a number of these uh, buildings here. And and uh, Charlie Foskett sort of stopped us and said, wait, wait a minute, we don't own those buildings. Have we talked to the Arlington Redevelopment Board? No, we haven't. Go do it. So we're here to say that we review these buildings and and it would be helpful to us, and probably a helpful and healthy thing for the town as well, uh, to share perspectives on it. We can share our perspective, and but primarily tonight we're here to ask you yours. If you've thought about the concept, this overarching civic block concept, and, and uh, if you've thought about the context of the central school and the, uh, these other properties in that context, and, and if not, um, let's let's talk about it. Okay. And, if, and if I may add, the way this has been coming before the Capital Planning Committee over the past several years, our, you, we've been our members the planning director, of course, um, but it doesn't all come from, from that department. Sometimes it has come from uh, the uh, health services, who have the senior center and so forth. But there's been requests that have come through about, oh, this building is in need of repair. Let's go and repair the building. Um, specifically, uh, I'll mention the carriage house. Carriage house is in dire need of repair. And the question always becomes, OK, if you repair it, what are you going to use it for? Well, it, I don't want to, I really don't want to diminish, diminish the answer, but it often comes out like, well, let's fix it, and then we'll figure out how to use it. And I think after a year or two or three of this, we're starting to say, let's not fix it and figure out how to use it. Let's figure out how we can use that building. And now we have the senior center needing some work, this building, and figure out maybe what the best use of these various buildings are, and then fund the projects accordingly. Otherwise, we will fund projects that will embed, in some cases, current uses, which may not be the best uses. And we just felt like it was a good opportunity to come before you, because these buildings, for the most part, come under your stewardship, and talk about, have you, as Barbara said, have you thought about this? Do you want us to try to think about this? Or have you got enough on your plate where you say, let's just, what happened with the way things are, let's just go back and just fix what's there, which we'll address differently. But you sent us a letter back in December, right. part of it precipitated our meeting tonight, uh, surrounding the Civic Block, Carriage House and Cottage at Central School, which I think is, is a main concern of the ARB. <clears throat> right now because it is managed and, and leased out by our, uh, our board and the high school. Uh, so I think the, the main thing we should talk about is the central school the condition of the central school. Mm -hmm. And I understand I, I met with uh, Christine earlier uh, last week and she was, I know she was invited, she told me that she may not come tonight. I don't see her here, but, but we talk about what she knows, and, and uh, uh, she is engaged in, let me not repeat it if you already know, the, if you've got a report from her at all. Uh, Go ahead. What, it's probably makes sense to Okay, it. She, she has uh, undertaken a, a contract with an architect planner, I've, I've got the notes in my notebook here, mm -hmm. um, and he's doing a, a um, a review of buildings. Uh, the he's doing a review of the central school building. I'm sorry, just the central school building. And he, she expects that she's going to have a preliminary report in the next few weeks from him that's going to give an estimate of, 
uh, what needs to be done, which we didn't have before. We, what we had been, what we had, as, as Steve said, we had, this is what we'd like to do with the building, and, and we'd like to knock this out and move this here and change this around. But we didn't have an assessment of the building. And he's come in and he said, you know, pre-World War II infrastructure, um, it's going to cost some bucks to make this just a, a building that stands up for the next several years. So it's not even so much a question of use, but he's also looking at that. And she's established a, uh, a senior citizens advisory committee, of, of which I'm a member of senior citizen center advisory committee. I'm a senior citizen too. So. Well, I'm, I'm not here. I'm not here. No, no, you don't count. But you're not on the committee. No, that's yeah. uh, so, um, so that's a, a fairly big committee, and we've met once or twice last spring, and um, that will be reconvened when the report comes out, and then they'll look at, at specific uses. In, in the interim, there's discussion about the possibility of a senior center uh, being added into the high school, which we have got the approval to go ahead with. Um, so that's. So then the question becomes, is this a, a permanent, smaller version of a, of a senior center that's located in different places? Is this a, a temporary location for a senior center that's going to be relocated someplace else? Or, or what exactly do we want to do with it? But I think that's sort of the, the committee's programmatic view with, under Christine's leadership. Um, but for you all, it's, it's really this this sort of bigger view of, of uh, how to use this building as, as part of this civic block, which the, uh, the uh, master plan came up with. So, um, yeah, I, I think the, the building that concerns us, I don't think, what are the Robins, is that under? No. no. So this is the only building that is under our purview of mm -hmm. the ones that are listed here. So. Definitely keep that in mind. So it's yeah. the only one that we can kind of speak to, or, yeah. or you know, uh, kind of go back and forth on. Uh, the other thing is, is it shouldn't be confused between the senior center and everything else that's this building, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, there are tenants in this building. There's, you know, actually a very large tenant, but I think moving on soon, right? So, yes. so that space is going to come up for lease um, mm -hmm. probably within the next year. Um, so, there's the senior center piece, which I think is what Christine is addressing, um, as far as architectural plans and everything yeah. else, looking at it, seeing whether the space is being used as best as possible, exactly. with respect to HIPAA and some of the counseling that they're doing. So, so I, think, I think we need to be sure that we're talking about the same things. Um, so, with respect, to, with respect to that, it sounds like Christine's, you know, uh, kind of working towards that. That's great, I guess, and we definitely would like to see what our architects come up with and that mm -hmm. type of thing. From my perspective, I mean, there's then there's the rest of the building, which we need to let out. I mean, we need mm -hmm. to lease that. Uh, that's an important part mm -hmm. of our being able to cover costs on this whole building so that the senior center can exist in here. So with respect to that, I think one of the issues that we have is, is I, you know, we can think about best use and, and everything else. But the fact is, is in a year's time, you know, we're, this thing's going to be up for lease. And if the stairs aren't fixed on that side, if the door outside right here isn't fixed, if, if we don't get some of these things fixed, then we're not going to be able to lease it out. No tenant is going to want to come in. Right. It's, it's not just cosmetic things. The no. systems in, in the building yeah. are well past so, the useful life that need to be replaced. So we appreciate that you're saying, hey, let's think about this holistically. Let's think about, is this how we want to use this building? Yeah. That's all well and good, but at some point, you're going to have a big white elephant here if yeah. we don't make some of these, uh, what's almost getting to be uh, dangerous uh, corrections on things. I mean, look at that. So it, it's, it, you know, it, it's, so I, yeah. I, think, I think we need to keep that in mind. Um, well, I think we're aligned because the Capital Planning Committee sort of has a, 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 um, a bond term view of things. You know, we yep. take out a 20 year bond and that's what we look at. How, what's this building going to be in 20 years, not what it's going to be next year? So 
that's the perspective that yeah I guess we take more of a lease type of approach than the 20 year right now uh, you know so the typical lease might be between five and seven years uh, potentially uh, so you know I guess we're thinking more in terms of that yeah and what can we get well I and I fully understand. Yeah, so that, but that's the stress that we're under and we're losing but, a big tenant. But I think what we're trying, the conversation we're trying to have, it, that's fair and you've got this imminent, urgent need. But one of the things we're trying to do is get the bigger conversation because you start down the path of only looking at it as a lease building and you've already drawn some conclusions. Now, that may be all you want to do with it. We're saying, you know, there may be other uses for the building in its entirety and saying for the benefit of the town, revenue is certainly a benefit. And I'm, I'm, I'm a finance person, I get that. And you want to cover the cost, you don't want to be a drain on the cash flow. But in the long run, you can start doing that, Michael, and, and you've already, you've already, you may have already made decisions that negate any discussion about the long term. You lock yourself into things that you then say five to seven years. Well, well, we'll talk about this in five to seven years. Our point is, why can't you talk about it now? So that when you make these more urgent, timely yep. repairs, you're doing it with an eye towards still being able to come up with new decisions, bigger decisions possibly, on what the building should be used for by the town of Arlington in the long and I think that's part of the discussion we're trying to have. Rather than just sit back and say, yes, approved, yes, approved, we're trying to make sure that there's, uh, we're, trying to, we're urging some longer term discussion at the same time. Yeah. Take care of the immediate, but let's not lose sight of You might have some great opportunities to do something with this building. Yeah. Yes, okay. And I, I think that's a great conversation to have. Um, I will also say that, from my perspective, the redevelopment board's um, uh, kind of marching orders are to take this building and make sure that it's not a drain on the, on the town. And that's what concerns me, is, is I, I want to make it as self-sufficient as possible. And it's always been a, it's always been a challenge, as far as, the, you know, since I've been here, uh, to make it self-sufficient because the senior center doesn't pay anything. So, so everything else has to pay for, you know, what it is as well as what we are able to get from the uh, capital, uh, the capital budget. So, um, so I'm not saying that the dialogue isn't good, that the conversation uh, can't happen uh, or shouldn't happen. I, my only point is, is, is we just have to understand what the consequences of not doing things ends up being. Yeah. So. I think um, we sort of have a good opportunity right now because when we wrote this letter back in December, we didn't have any sense at all of what Christine was going to hear uh, from the advisory uh, architect, but um, and she had asked for two hundred thousand and then two million, and and we said no, which is just a recommendation. It's not a decision, but we said no. This doesn't. We, we can't support this because we're not seeing what that money is going to be for, and it was it was more like it was just for programmatic uses for a senior center. Now that we understand that it's more for the infrastructure, or will be probably next year, I think we would support it next year. But to Steve's point, I think there's an opportunity here for us to figure out between our two committees what our perspectives are, and maybe there's maybe one of us should come in. Our, our <coughs> world lasts from uh, the beginning of September when all of the department heads send in their capital requests. And then we meet about every other week uh, through uh, right up till well, Christmas Eve, and uh, and then take a break and then go to finance committee to present our recommendations. So that's it's really a fall period where we really crunch the 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 recommendations for capital in it. And it might, if you want to think, not not decide now, but at some point, do you want us to come in and kind of give you a report of the public buildings in your purview that have uh, financing requests. I don't know if you see them automatically. Not necessarily. Yeah, I was surprised to, that Christine yeah. did not even know that we had recommended uh, that she not get funded. That was yeah. a surprise to me. So there, there's an opportunity to kind of knit together communication a little bit, I think. Sounds good. Yeah. OK, 
Ken or Andy? Yeah, um, I hear what you're saying, and I, I very much agree with what you're saying there as far as having an understanding of what the plan of the future is before we spend money on it. But I think Mike brings a very good point too. Is there a way we, we can uh, separate something out where short term life safety fixes? and then long-term master plan and fix it. And I think that is something that we can both share and then we can have a better understanding of. And then I think having a dialogue as far as what the plan for the center is, is really good because we do want uh, what's the other spaces to support the senior center. Okay, and we felt that's something that's a goal of ours. Right. So and I think, <coughs> Right, I think that's, <clears throat> that's exactly, I think if you discern, you know, life, that's a good term, life saving for the life of the building, <clears throat> thing that have to get done immediately or in the short run to, to make sure we still have a building to talk about. Mm -hmm. really yeah. Yeah. Like, yeah. And, and make sure we're not creating a massive drain on the town. And, and, and I think to some extent that's sort of where we started to push back is it was unclear. Which this was. Yeah, which yeah. each of, which each of yeah. these things are. And I think... Part of it is this, you know, you ultimately have jurisdiction of the building, but you do have this sort of split jurisdiction with the senior center with another department. And, and all we're trying to do is say, let's sort of get people in the room. Do it, fine, do what needs to be done. You don't want the building to go unleashed in the short run. But let's start having an eye towards what, what the ultimate purpose would be. The fact that we've got this high school, which is not your concern immediately, except as you know, residents of the town, but um, going on as well, and an opportunity to once again a major building in town to look at how our services you know, the, that are provided by the town housed, which buildings are they housed in, and what makes the most sense. I mean, we, we tried to have this discussion several years ago as well with the uh, job department. You know that, that the, the law office is in, and you know <laughs> that's one that actually it did get away from us. Well, from my perspective, on capital planning, because once you started, then you couldn't stop, and that's one of the things that happens with old buildings. Once you start, yeah, you you started. Right. You know, right. sometimes there are surprises behind the wall that you then have to address it and address immediately. So again, I think Ken, uh, Ken, that's that's exactly what we're trying to do is identify what are the things that have to get done to make sure that you can still do it in, the, in the short run. But let's have an eye towards what is the discussion about the ultimate long-term use? What is the best use for an asset of the town of Bowman? Say just one more thing about Civic Block, and maybe I'm, maybe you can add something to the, the concept. But the, uh, our interest in the Civic Block was not to advocate for a particular use, uh, and, and not to advocate for it to be a senior center, but rather to keep in mind, just like you said, well, life safety code an overarching goal of, of making this the civic center of Arlington uh, for <coughs> civic purposes. So if there are offices that are scattered around, can we, instead of rebuilding them someplace else, can we put them in here? Is there a savings for that? Jeez. Uh, so sorry. Yeah, I must have popped the movie call. <laughs> Anyway, that's all. I'm done. Great. And I think this is a great idea, long overdue. How do we start the process of looking at the big picture, knowing that we have to deal with the, the immediate? Do we do it with the master planning group, or what, what do you suggest, Laura? Then? Um, I think I need to talk to the town manager first to see what he is thinking, if anything, um, and then perhaps the master plan implementation committee could take. I, I, I think this idea of the civic block and finding out how you can get mixed governmental use or mixed nonprofit mm -hmm. things that contribute to the town, that yeah. we can, it may be a way to think long term about it. So yeah, kind of a synergy. Right. So I think it's a great idea. I'd like to. I think we should be involved in it in some way. I'd like to know how that's going to happen. You know, I, I think that there were so many recommendations that came out of the master plan, and we started with the ones that we're working on right now. And um, I think as things get underway here, with the zoning bylaw changes, it will free up the staff to sort of take on, and the Master Plan Implementation Committee to sort of get to the next level. But, um, you know, we, 
we don't have the capacity to take up to take on all of the implementation steps at one time. But I think that I know that there's a lot of interest in the historic properties and dealing better with them, the town owned historic properties, and I think that, that will be the next order of business after these zoning bylaw changes are um, you know, ready for town meeting. We could probably start before they go to town meeting, but um, we're still, they're still changing and we're, the staff mm -hmm. is working on them pretty much full time right now. But we are also short staff, so. We'll put it on the list, high up. Well, I, I very much appreciate your interest and um, let's keep chatting. Yeah, I'm gonna keep chatting and Absolutely. see how Absolutely. we can, I don't know where to start either. <coughs> Stop the conversation, that's a good start. And then figure out what, it, and then, you know, like I think make sure we're fully conscious of the urgent, imminent needs what you have to do to keep the leasing going while we're... While if that's what we want to do, at least have that conversation right up front. Right. So, you know. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So moving on to discussion of uh, an amendment to the lease between our board and the Mystic River Watershed Association, which does have space uh, in Central School and one of our tenants. So Laura, if you could tell us a little bit about what they're looking to do here. Uh, yes. Um, the Mystic River Watershed Association is a, a relatively small nonprofit. Um, when they first started, they had a small office in um, on the second floor of this building, which they had for free for a little while. And then as they grew, and um, I think mostly through, they get grants to do um, <coughs> testing and um, advocacy for the Mystic River uh, and they recently got another grant and are growing again and they wanted to get a little bit more space short term. Um, I think they're asking for 305 additional square feet. We have an office that we can give them that they're satisfied with. They pay less than most of the tenants in the building. They pay about $10 a foot and we're just proposing to, pro to expand to, um, to expand the space at the same rate. Um, it's it's a, it's a space that we're not getting any rent on right now. Um, so this is just an, an amendment to the lease. Their lease comes up fairly soon, I believe September, and um, so we'll be re renegotiating with them at that time. So this is an extension only for the summer? From uh, No, they're gonna move in February 15th, I think. Okay, so from now till, till the fall? Is this the space under the... Yeah, yeah. it's the space that um, Fred was Fred was in, yeah, okay. Yeah, who <coughs> takes care of the building. Yeah, yeah no, that makes sense. Yeah. Ken, Ken? Uh, yeah, I agree. I, I move to, uh, mm -hmm. move to accept this amendment uh, to the lease as described. And authorize the chair to sign. Authorize the chair to sign this lease. All right, staff. Bruce. I know. Right. <laughs> the master. Exactly. Do we have a second? I'll second it. All in favor? Aye. 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 Good. Okay. We are a few minutes ahead of schedule, so what I'd like to do is uh, take a five minute recess until the 7 30. Do you want to go to our discussions? Or uh, will that depend on? Yeah, we'll okay. Right. So we'll take a five minute recess up until uh, 7 30. We'll have a discussion on the mixed use uh, zoning uh, amendments. If anyone did not get the handouts for the agenda that are up front here, please come up and, and grab one. That is a summary of the mixed use changes. We have more detailed summaries. Um, if someone's interested, but we just want to kind of get the gist of it out. We're going to put the minutes, which isn't on the agenda, is it? But we, we had put it on for the last
you like another copy? No, I'm here. I just, I'm, not, I'm sorry. That was absolutely Well, let's then no one will remember. I did. Okay. Is that something I can get a copy of at some point? Uh, when it's released, yeah, I don't know if it's released. Okay. Can you email it to me when it gets released? Okay, that'd be great. Thank you.
So it's about 7.33, I'd like to bring us back in. Uh, next on the agenda is uh, discussion of zoning amendments for mixed use in Arlington. And I'm going to turn the floor to Ted Fields to lead us through some of the proposed changes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, as many of you know, uh, over the past two and a half years, the town has uh, been engaged in preparing a master plan. Uh, that was uh, endorsed by the Redevelopment Board and Town Meeting last year. And in the course of compiling that master plan, uh, we, the Planning Department that spearheaded the effort along with the Master Plan Advisory Committee, heard a lot of resident input, uh, including a desire for uh, rejuvenating uh, the town's commercial districts, especially those along Mass Ave and Broadway, uh, rejuvenating the commercial properties in those commercial districts with new types of businesses, new types of uses that really kind of are flourishing with the more modern economy that we have, the what we call postmodern industrial, or the information age economy, the creative economy that's starting to um, emerge um, in the 21st century. And, um, a lot of uh, people also uh, really uh, desired um, uh, a development of mixed use in our commercial districts, meaning combination of residential with uh, retail, offices, other types of commercial uses in the same building uh, so that you have a lot more activity in our commercial districts, you have a lot more vitality, you have a lot more um, just vibrancy uh, in our commercial districts, especially along, as I said, Mass Ave and Broadway. Um, and in the course of uh, developing the master plan, uh, we, uh, the planning department and the planning consultant uh, really uh, enumerated a number of benefits of mixed use development, including um, the fact that it adds development where there is already infrastructure, it doesn't use uh, the, the, any sort of greenfield development or any sort of vacant land that really we don't have anymore in town. Uh, it adds to the tax base uh, for, it accentuates the value of existing parcels in the tax base. It revitalizes business districts by providing customers for local businesses, <coughs> restaurants, and cultural institutions. It adds to street life, nightlife, and social interaction, and a sense of community, especially in the central parts of town where folks want to see more activity, want to see more a, a wider range of uses. Um, and the residential units that are attracted to these types of mixed-use developments and the downtown type of environments that they uh, proliferate tend to be smaller, serving smaller households, uh, especially elderly people and young singles. 
So it would help to diversify the town's housing stock. Uh, and it would help to uh, lead to what they call multi-generational housing, where people can move out of uh, single-family homes and stay within town and move to smaller units closer to services, closer to shopping, without the need to drive uh, to access those services. And in many cases, such units may be relatively more affordable um, for uh, different people and the different ends of the income spectrum. And then finally, uh, such development really helps to reduce car dependence because it's uh, developed in many cases on top of or next to services, uh, commercial services, government services, cultural institutions, and transit facilities uh, like bus lines on Mass Ave and Broadway. It reduces congestion, reduces pollution, reduces land needed for parking, and it reduces, uh, in many cases, the number of residents who commute out of town. Uh, so it, it helps um, with the, uh, the overall uh, sustainability of the town in that respect. After the master plan was uh, adopted and endorsed, uh, the planning department uh, set about with the master plan implementation committee to develop uh, some zoning bylaw amendments that would make mix, developing mixed use properties uh, more easier and um, more practical. Uh, and to do that, uh, we've expanded uh, and added definitions to include some new types of industries, as well as to define, to define mixed use development itself. Uh, we've also um, allowed new industries and mixed use uh, in all business and industrial zones, except there's no industrial, uh, there's no residential uses in industrial right now. Uh, and we would allow these by special permit. Uh, as part of the special permit um, process, we would increase FAR, maximum FAR to 1.5 for parcels under 20,000 square feet in business and industrial districts. And we would also slightly increase maximum height to four stories in the B2 zone and industrial zones with a step back after the third story. We'll define the step back for you later on in, with uh, the Gamble Associates presentation. Um, and we will increase uh, the maximum height to five stories in B2A, B3, B4, and B5 zones, again with a step back after the third story. Uh, and it's important to realize that uh, in each of these cases, uh, with a height increase, we would also maintain the existing uh, residential height buffer regulations, uh, but those, that would require uh, a reduction in the maximum height to, by one story uh, instead of two stories is what's now called for. Um, and in terms of parking, uh, mixed-use structures would be allowed to reduce the amount of parking required uh, as part of the special permit process as long as they adopt this transportation demand management plan that would really kind of enumerate how they would reduce reliance on cars. Uh, it would allow shared parking in mixed-use developments. So the Business uses would share parking with residential uses, as long as the the, the activity pattern was was uh, complementary. And then finally, it would exempt the first 3,000 square feet of commercial space in the mixed use development from parking requirements. Um, this would be a, an incentive for mixed commercial for commercial use within mixed use structures. So that's our uh, mixed use zoning amendments in a nutshell. And with that, I'm going to turn the floor over to our consultants, David Gamble and his assistant, Brian. Hi, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Brian Gregory, and uh, I'm my colleague, David, at Gamble Associates. We're invited by the town to sort of play through uh, what the ramifications are of the changes to the zoning bylaws, and sort of provide a, a litmus test to see if the building forms on um, sort of generic parcels that exemplify uh, the type of parcels you'd see along Broadway and the Mass Ave corridor, under the new guidelines would produce the kind of development that the town's uh, master plan was looking to foster. So this is just an aerial, but 
the town center, the edge of Somerville, and there's Broadway sort of linking up with Mass Ave. And so we're really looking along the commercial corridors and trying to understand how to encourage the type of growth the town is looking to have. And just mm -hmm. as a little uh, point of departure, so our firm uh, was a sub-consultant on the Comprehensive Master Plan. And then one of the recommendations of that Comprehensive Master Plan, which was a set of design guidelines for these sort of major corridors in town, the Millbrook, the Minuteman Bikeway, and the commercial corridors of Mass Ave and Broadway, we, uh, we also uh, generated a set of design guidelines for those to start to describe what type of urbanism you want there, what, what general types of building forms and uses we're going to activate those spaces and increase the sort of vibrancy of these cherished corridors. And so we're, we're excited to be back and to be looking now at what are the sort of tools the town has to produce those buildings that we were looking to have along these spaces. So I'm going to sort of start with the vision and work back to the details, going to sit, because in a sense that's how you're acting. You, you, you have an idea of what you want and then we start trying to sort of draw back into the, the nuts and bolts of how to produce that. What we're looking for sort of is the, these types of mixed-use buildings here where on the first story, since you're along a, a maybe a, a busier street, you're not looking to put residential right up against the edge, but you're looking to reinforce the street wall. And so a base of retail, parking towards the rear, the building up towards the front to create a more inviting pedestrian experience and reduce the amount of curb cuts, maybe some, some flow outdoor seating that you see along like Newbury Street and other locations. And then a mix of smaller housing units up at the top to, again, as Ted mentioned, provide that sort of multi-generational housing and provide a housing stock that really is in demand in Arlington, but you don't have much of su a supply of. So this is just maybe another view trying to show how sort of creating vibrancy, maybe connections to some of the main corridors like the Minuteman and such. And that even, you know, there may be the want to allow that level of flexibility in the, in the zoning to allow for, after you have sort of step backs, to allow for some height here to be able to provide maybe outdoor amenity spaces or other things like that to tenants to again sort of bring the vibrancy of the building to its edges and allow for a more diverse architecture. So along those lines, what we ended up doing was doing a little study of the parcels specifically along Broadway and found, uh, you know, indicative of a number of them and it sort of created a generic catch-all parcel. So this one, you know, Broadway or Mass Ave would be along here. There's always little side streets sort of connecting in, sort of picked a corner condition to reinforce how you would meet that edge. It's sort of got two faces, but this one's about 90 feet along the main way at about 120 feet deep. So you're looking at about 10,800 square feet, about 11,000 square feet. So that falls within that under 20,000 square foot things that we're looking to do. And sort of the basic way you'd start to lay out this site if I was, you know, looking to develop it, you know, good urbanism dictates the building should be towards the street edge, it's where the visibility is, it's where the pedestrian realm is, parking is shielded towards the rear, it also puts more space between this building and what is most likely an existing residential fabric. And then there's different setbacks, so, you know, um, based on how this is calculated, 9, 10 feet in the back, there's actually within the zoning, it dictates that in this instance it would be 9. And then, you know, the setbacks along the edge of the parking because you want to sort of create a landscape buffer. And they don't need to be exorbitantly deep, but, but five feet is enough to allow for a visual screening. Moving forward then, you know, going into a little more depth, is there's, there's sort of rules of thumbs for development. And so it's the next litmus test, in a way. Parking lots, if you're looking to sort of do double parking with a central drive aisle, is 60 feet wide or so. Buildings can range a little bit, but if you're looking for residential, you're looking 55 to 65 feet. It gets you an interior corridor and rooms on either side, something akin to what you'd see in a hotel hallway sort of deal. And then moving forward again, with those parameters, you can start to sort of lay out a ground floor. And so in this instance, based on sort of the last comment, G under the proposed zoning bylaw changes, this idea of exempting the first 3,000 square feet I think is, is sort of a novel way to encourage commercial uh, retail on the ground floor because currently there's a lot of parking usually in zoning tied up in that. So it discourages people because all of your parking suddenly gets gobbled up by one and you end up with you know a single story retail, a CBS, or just housing. And if you're looking to get a mix of both, there's sort of a pliability in you there. So sort of playing with this one, it worked out rather well. 
And this is about 3,000 square feet. So as a developer, you might come forward and say, well, okay, let me see if I do that. I don't have any parking associated with that yet, so that's a good starting place. You have a stair core coming down here and here, let's say, for the upper stories. You know, there'll be two of them at some point. An elevator from a, for a sort of urban design standpoint as well as a marketing visibility standpoint. The retail comes to the front corner, sort of the 100% visibility. You have the lobby accessing both the primary street as well as a connection to the parking. So, so far, so good. Then sort of testing out the other side of the ground level. Parking spaces are about 9 feet by 18 feet. Sort of dividing that out, leaving some radius for turning and for enter and entrance, as well as accommodating spaces for handicap. The site can accommodate comfortably about 15 spaces. And so while by the zoning, you don't need those necessarily for the retail, although it certainly helps to have some, that's going to start to control for the housing, the residential units above as we go forward. Oh, and I should mention, sorry. Um, the other test would be to make sure that the exterior space, which in this is sort of aligned around the outside in order to provide a buffer to the sort of adjacent properties, you sort of just run that, and that does check out 1,400 feet the demand would be for about 10%, so you know, 1,800, so. So then the next thing you're looking at is, is that if you roughly have the footprint of your building, how are you going to calculate how big of the building? Well, that's generated by FAR, floor area ratio. And it's basically taking the size of the lot, and so that's 10,800 square feet, multiplying it by the FAR, which is being proposed at 1.5, and so you realize there's about a little north of 16,000 square feet that you can develop. And then the next <coughs> calculation you're going to do is sort of the size of the floor plate. And based on what we sort of outlined here, just multiplying it up, it's about a little shy of 4,000 square feet. So roughly 16 divided by roughly 4. You're looking at about a four-story building. That seems about the density you're looking for. You're between three and five long commercial corridors. So again, so far, so good, and so the, the yellow space would be residences, and it's the elevator and stairs coming up. Forward. So then the other parameter, though, is for the increased height, in order to sort of visually reduce the presence of the building, especially from the commercial corridor, we're looking for a step back. And these are different than a setback, which is the whole building. A step back happens as you move up the building, it steps back. And so here, since this is only a four-story building and not a five, you have maybe a, a smaller step back of about five feet along the edges that front the commercial corridors to, again, visually reduce the height of the building without reducing the amount of developable space appreciably. And that offset can go into, you know, there's, there's the needs for, like, you know, sprinklers and rooms and other things like that in a sort of a basement scenario. So we're still at about four stories. Looking at the units, just taking a sort of a quick rule of thumb from a lot of the units that are being built on the periphery of the city, you're starting to see uh, smaller units as affordability becomes more of an issue. So taking in line something along Assembly Row, which just is sort of built in Somerville, not too far from here, you're looking at 900 square feet for a two bedroom, uh, about 675 square feet for a, a nicely sized but sort of small one bedroom, and then you can go all the way down. Uh, to a studio would be more at 500, this is the next slide, but, but each of these, the two floors above the retail here break out into about four units with a nice mix of two two-bedrooms, the two one-bedrooms per floor for a total of eight, and then moving up. This floor is a little different just because of the sort of step back up here. It does allow these units to have balcony space or outdoor space, which is great for bringing sort of the inside of the building out to the edge, but on this one, you'd end up with a two-bedroom, a one-bedroom, and then the reduction leaves you two studios at about 500 square feet, which is about appropriate. And so moving forward, you can sort of see if you just sort of put up the walls as it was in between the units, you end up roughly with a volume of a building like this, where you have the lower three-story portion, and then the taller four-story portion with the step back there, and a small step back maybe for the entrance of the building. And then sort of moving back towards the parking to, again, sort of provide that test. 15 spaces, 12 units, 1.25, which, which actually works out nicely. Every unit could have one space with either visitor parking or a space or two for the retail below. And then so just moving forward one more, a little less of a diagrammatic, a little more aspirational. This is what maybe the articulation of the building is, you know, more retail at the bottom, an awning signaling the entrance, smaller windows for the residential, 
maybe even an outdoor space or a green roof on the upper stories with the parking pulled to the rear and a place for seating in front. So the, the end result of this, or I guess the overarching idea is that yes, the changes as planned, were I a, a developer or early architect of a developer, it does allow me to produce a building, 12 units, mix of the units, 3,000 square feet of retail, which is you know a large cafe uh, type of space. So it, it bears out, it passes the litmus test as it was. And with that, I'll turn it back over. Thank you. <clears throat> we also have some members from the Master Plan Implementation Committee here tonight, so I give them the opportunity to speak their piece about how this came together. Okay. Thank you. I'm Charlie Kolowskis, uh, co-chair of the Master Plan uh, Implementation Committee. I was a co-chair for the uh, Master Plan Advisory Committee, and with me are Joe Barr, who's also a co-chair, and Ralph Lomar, members of the Implementation Committee. Um, first thing I want to say is that mixed use is not a new concept in Arlington. Um, Arlington was a streetcar suburb. There were probably tracks on Massachusetts Avenue. And if you look at the Capitol Block, it's a prime example of mixed use with retail on the first floor, residential above. Arlington Heights is the same, where you have retail on the first floor, look at the five and ten and residential above. So this is not a new concept to Arlington, nor is it a new concept to uh, a lot of the inner suburban communities in, uh, in the Boston region. <coughs> I think it was a new concept that's come back in a different form. And as Ted alluded to, some of the uses have changed as well um, that are being proposed in mixed use or allowed uses. Um, and that's indicate an indication of how the economy has changed over time as well. So I think what we're really looking at in terms of any proposed changes is to adapt to the 21st century economy. And, and housing needs have also changed as well. Um, Ted alluded to the need for senior housing, the need for um, uh, single uh, people who uh, don't need that much space. Um, and there's also the possibility of having affordable uh, units as well, people who, who need uh, more affordable rents. So um, we fully support this. We, uh, through the entire master planning process, all the public meetings we had, um, this came out over and over again as a way to spur um, economic development, revitalization in certain business districts. I think the main thing is it's also uh, revenue positive for the town. Um, we did have our consultant look at certain scenarios with buildings such as uh, Brian showed. In fact, there's a net uh, positive revenue stream for the town with this type of development. So it's really um, a, a lot of benefits go along with mixed use development. So Joe or Ralph want to add to Discussion. So I guess just a, a couple of thoughts from my again, Joe Barr, I'm the co-chair with Carl, Charlie at the implementation, uh, mass plan implementation I guess um, in my day job I'm a transportation person. Um, so I'll just mention a couple things about the transportation and parking piece of this. Um, although I'll first I'll echo what Charlie just said about the fact that this was something we heard I think repeatedly and you know consistently throughout the development of the master plan, which took two and a half years or so was a desire for more mixed use, but I think it's important to rem remind everybody that it's you know along the commercial corridor, so we're kind of dipping our toe in the water and in locations where, as Charlie alluded to, with you know many of the locations along Mass Ave and even to some extent on Broadway, we already have some form of mixed use, and this is just trying to you know further um, spread that or, or or confirm that it's something that people want to see. Uh, in terms of the transportation, I guess just a couple of points to make. One is I think, you know, there is a, a, a long and I think pretty successful history with the type of transportation and management measures that are that are contemplated in the, in the zoning amendment. So I mean, you know, I think the, the fact that it's, you know, generally would be, you know, I think or exclusively would be through a special permit review. So that gives the, the granting authority the ability to review what's being proposed, figure out does it make sense in the context of the location that's being looked at and the transit that's available as well as the other modes that are available in very strong, you know, bicycle network, you know, through and around the town. So I think that's something else that we can take advantage of uh, in terms of reducing, you know, car 
transportation demand. So I think that you know this is I think structured very well to create those kinds of um, that review to make sure that there's actually an ability to get that they didn't just sort of check a couple of boxes. They really have made a commitment to doing the, the right thing. And then I think the shared parking piece is also very important, as, as the folks from Gamble Associates demonstrated. You know this this type of development as, as they sort of contemplated here. You know would have you know parking that. You know, both by having a 3,000 square foot kind of de minimis exemption for the retail, which is not uncommon in, in sort of more in denser locations because you know there's on-street parking, you know that there's some level of non-vehicular demand, but also, you know, the ability to do shared parking in a situation like this where you have retail, it's more likely to be active during the day, and then um, re residential, which is more likely to generate most of its parking demand overnight, you know, the ability to trade off back and forth between the two, so whether it's you know, just doing the de minimis exemption or having a shared parking arrangement, you know, these kinds of, you know, shared commercial and residential developments often, you know, don't need to meet every single parking requirement separately, which is, I think, one of the challenges we have right now with the zoning code. So I think this, you know, this, this is a, a, I think, a well, from the master plan implementation committee's perspective, I think the staff and the consultants have sort of translated what we wanted from a overall policy perspective into some, you know, what seems like a, a good approach to making it, it real. So like Charlie said, I think we're, we're fully supportive and we had a working group of the implementation committee that sort of talked through the details and I think we made some good tweaks and adjustments to get to where we are uh, today. Okay. Thank you. Mike. Um, so, uh, I don't have too much. It, actually, could someone just walk me through the table a little bit then? Maybe the original thing or whatever else. Sure. Um, so it's the Article 6. So just kind of going through that. Um, so yes, I was just trying to, trying to. This is what was passed out back in the early days. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And um, so from the. So just help me with a couple things. Number one is. is where it says step back greater than three, obviously that's that's after the third story. It right. has to be stepped back. Yeah. And part of my ignorance, but how do you know how far the step back is? Is that already in the bylaw that it would be five feet, or no, is that something uh, that would have to like get in there as well? That's or? something that actually we haven't determined a standard for yet. We're, okay. still, we're looking at different standards or whether to have a minimum step back that has a special But we would need to have or, that as, as, yeah. as a piece I think of you'd this. want a minimum and then have the right. ability, the ability to, to do, yeah. to, go, to go further back. Okay. I okay. think we want, to, we want to get the, the reading from the Gamble um, Associates that of what, what would be a, a step back that would work from the perspective of the street without making a whole floor un, unusable. Right. And, and they're saying <laughs> five feet. So I, and that would make its way somewhere within <laughs> that would be incorporated yeah. definitions. Yeah. Or, or this is still like we're still amending, and this is still yeah. yeah. The next time you see this, it'll be more in the form of uh, got it. An amendment. Yeah. Okay, I just wanted to, to make sure I wasn't missing something that was already somewhere else because yeah. Lord knows with our bylaw, it well could be somewhere else. So. <laughs> um, I think as a concept, it's fairly no to the bylaw. It's, it is no. It's yeah. Step okay. Back. Okay. The Except step back the is. is a variation on that. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is what we had seen before. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I guess I'd be interested in commentary ar ar around height and that type of thing in several of the different uh, uh, districts. I, I, you know, I think the, the four story that we saw with the fourth story kind of step back, that, that seems like that could fit in most places in town, in my opinion. <laughs> um, I think the five story with the step back after four. Um, I think you know. I, I I wonder whether that just doesn't get a little bit uh, a little bit higher than what we're used to anyway. Um, but with respect to that, you've got two different numbers on the uh, height maximum, like say there B two A. Is that just why why is it, does it say five step back? Well, that's in the eight. current zoning bylaws for the height buffer. So if depending on where your uh, where you are is located. It uh, right now calls for a reduction in height. Reduction if you're within if you're that 200 buffer. feet. Okay, the so the property. second number is the buffer number. Yes, that's so we're keeping that in, but we're Got it. modifying. But well, you're modifying it. Yes. Okay. Okay. All right, and I, I think the thing that might be helpful, 
you know, when we, when we start really digging in on, on height and that type of thing is, is what are the, most of these are at 3 and 35 now, is that right? Yeah, uh, the central business is five. The central business, B5 is, is five. B5 is five, okay. Yes. okay. Most of the others are three or four. Okay. That, that might just be helpful just to okay. understand sure. um, what we'd be, what we'd be changing because it is kind of hard to do. Um, other than that, uh, I, didn't, I didn't have too much for right now. Maybe okay. There's, there's something else. Okay. Uh, well, we'll begin to move it. Well, let me start off one of my first concerns is um, you, you, we want to encourage affordable housing as part of this fix. It is, uh, uh, mixed, mixed use district here. How are we doing that? Um, the bylaw says that if there's more than six units, 15% have to be affordable. So, um, what is the number of units here? 12. 12. 12. So, if 12 units, you'd have two affordable units okay. automatically. Yes, but that's the bylaws. That's the bylaw. How but the, the existing bylaws. Yes. How are we encouraging more? Uh, well, I think if the units are smaller, they may be less expensive, but we can't force them to be less expensive. No, we can't force people to do anything they don't want, but how do we encourage? It's a question, and I've mm -hmm. seen uh, other towns do, and, and uh, they don't, no, they don't say, they don't require more, they leave an option. So if, if a developer wants to, um, provide more affordable housing, they have an increase or a bump in the FAR. It's, it's fair. I mean, we're trying to be fair. We're not trying to dictate people. I'm just bringing it up as, as a question. I'm not trying to um, tell it, you know, I'm just thinking that if we want to encourage more affordable housing, how do we go about doing that? Above and beyond what we have right now. That's one thing I want to bring up, and I've been saying, do we want to think about um, having some trade-offs for that? That's all. Interesting. And let's talk about that. It, I, I'm not saying one is right and one is wrong, but let's talk about that. And we might say, that's not for us. That's okay. But if that is for us, and let's see what we can do by encouraging that from developers. They're not going to give it away for free. I don't see anybody doing that. Charlie, you want to respond to that? Yeah, I think what we heard in the master plan um, project committee meetings was a lot of the property along Massachusetts Avenue Broadway abuts residential neighborhoods. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's why a lot of the height restrictions are here in terms of number of square feet, because the higher you can go, the more units you can get, the more opportunity there is for more affordable units. But we, we need to respect the uh, abutting land uses particularly the residential communities. Now there may be sites where the residential uh, neighborhoods are set back even farther. Um, well, and well, in I those cases, you may be able to go even higher, but we didn't propose that. I agree with you when you say that, because I see where you have your 120 feet, that's pretty generous. But what about the sites that are only 50 feet back, or 60 feet back, or 80 feet back? Okay, and I'm not, I'm not trying to be so I'm just saying that all the setbacks <coughs> that we've been talking about is always up front. What about setbacks in the back, if it's within a certain distance? And I'm saying, what if we have setbacks in the back where if someone looked further up, they could have a, a, a patio or a porch out there that looks up to a nice view? And that could be advantageous. And I see a developer wanting to say, okay, we have a, a penthouse levels where we have uh, more setbacks. So that higher rent or higher cost for that could offset the cost of building less because you're pulling it back. It's, it's always this trade-off. Um, but giving them a more opportunity to get more value for what they're building for their product, we're increasing our value to the, to the neighborhoods. That's all I'm saying, and we thought about that. And I do also want to mention about the five feet. Can we maybe think of moving more than five feet? Because five feet, to me, it's not an occupied space. Okay, five feet, you get up there, you, you might have a little small chair, you have coffee or tea or 
have a smoke and that's it. You don't really live out there. Uh, if we if we just gave it a little bit more space, now it could become a space where it's an outdoor space that actually someone can actually spend time and live out there a little bit and that act the light and and you can do it. You can have more. Yes, but if <laughs> but you're not mandating. Yes, I'm just saying that if you're not going to encourage, I use the word encourage. Okay, I, I, all right, these things ain't going to happen. <clears throat> I just don't think it's happening. I mean, if you say five feet, I'm sure they're just going to build five feet. And, you know, and they say, hey, here's your balcony. I will say it, that is subject to special, uh, that would be a special permit condition if the board or an, another board in special permit training authority feels that <coughs> step backs for a certain project beyond the minimum are required, I'm sure they could put that into the conditions of the special permit. <coughs> On a specific project. But we are open to different no, loans I, or something. I, I, I respect that too. But then the other thing is this. As a developer trying to purchase land to put up a project, if they don't know what all the real, um, regulations are, there is some um, uh, interpretations or um, depends on what requests are, they're not going to know how to value that land. And they're not, and they're not going to they're not going to want to um, take, no chance. take the chance, mm -hmm. okay? Um, you know, development is all about risk and managing risk. So if they knew more, there's less risk, there's, then that's in itself encouraging development. So as long as you can encourage development by being clear, it's a no-brainer. Hmm. Just going to jump in here. Just one point related to the affordability. I mean, I think assuming that this is a form of development that we want to encourage, sort of in a back or on its own merits, having the shared parking arrangements and not forcing a developer to meet all of them, the parking arrangements separately, and parking is an expensive thing to provide and it provides functionally no economic value to the developer. Mm -hmm. So, to the extent that we're providing that de minimis amount, you know, without parking or a shared parking arrangement that reduces their cost of development and so potentially could enable further affordability whether through official affordable units or just reduced rents and I, we see that a lot on the transportation side is that if we can get the you know, reduce the parking demand and let them let a developer create more space for you know actual apartments or whatever that that does help with affordability it's you know it's a marginal contribution but obviously every bit every piece will help a little bit Having said that, I was wondering whether you'd ever seen parking being the thing that gets decreased in order to to, to encourage that affordability. Because around here, parking's king. I mean, that's what we we see more about parking than we do anything else. So, even or usually, anything. parking dictates how many units. Right, but I'm saying if you have an affordable unit, you don't need a parking spot for it or something like it. Like if you were to. I wouldn't go that. I, 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 I'm just. Okay. I, I'm not either. I'm just saying. I, I, is, did you ever see it? Is that ever done? Is that um, I think some of the other ways of encouraging parking. Let's say, is, say if the site is tight. Right now, you have no covered parking. If the parking is covered, let's say the building overhangs the parking. Now that becomes FAR. Correct. It would increase the. Yes. So one of the ways of how having parking uh, maybe help with that uh, demand and make it more affordable, but uh, so you can build a little more is maybe um, the first five, 10, 15 parking spaces that are um, covered doesn't count. It gets exempt from um, <coughs> FAR. And then that gives you an ability to have a, a little larger building above for the tighter sites. Mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm, I'm just, <laughs> this is very, uh, I, I want to continue talking up here, but we're, we're down here in the details, and I don't want to get down here in the details quite yet. And I don't think we should be at that details here at this meeting. Um, no, I'll leave it up to the professionals to think about it a little more. But I'm just thinking in terms of broader scopes of what we're trying to encourage. And I applaud what we're trying to do here, encouraging 
multifamily, encouraging, affordable, occurring, all the stuff. Great. I just want to bring up a couple of questions about how we go about, how we go about encouraging that. That's that's pretty just the general system. Okay. Great. Any? What's the uh, residential height buffer? How, just explain how that works. Well, uh, in general terms, depending on where a property is located, generally on Mass Ave or Broadway, if there is a residence within, depending on the direction of the residence, within a certain distance, the height of the building is reduced. So those are maintained in this? That's, that's in the current bylaw. And is that the other number that's in the list where it says five or four? Is it listed here in the... But yeah, I, right now, if it's five, if you, if a building in question is in the height buffer, right. go down to four. But that's not what you have here in the height map in the table on page four. Yeah. Well, yeah, it's I follow the existing format of the table, where if there's two heights listed, the first height is the regular height, the second height is the height in the height buffer area. So it does reflect. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's listed. Just put a note or ask. I, yeah, I, I for, will. Yeah, for some of us. I'll mark that up. Need the education. Okay. Um, that's good. I think that's great. Um, and what Mike said, I think, is important to put in existing heights floor so we can see. Sure. Um, the uh, setback, I mean, I like David and the group, Brian, to weigh in eventually as you develop it. I was going to go the other way, <laughs> saying you mean maybe with some incentives that <clears throat> only 50% of the frontage has to be set back. But as I'm hearing you guys talk, and Ken talk especially, maybe that's more of like an incentive package. So you got to keep it clear, I get it, okay? you got to keep it clear. So you can't be vague about it, but I like your idea of somehow there are things that you could trigger to allow you, let's say you did something else that would allow you to have less setback. So there's more flexibility for a developer who's really going to want to get a higher rent out of that third floor than he's going to want to get out of the second, or the, or the lower floor. See, so it's a little tough, I could imagine, for some of them. So is there some kind of a trade-off where you say, if you want to go 50% not setback, you would have to do something else? But I don't know. I'm just asking that you know, that might be a way to play that. It's, I'm worried about the developer having to reduce that, those, those units that he's trying to build a, a stack of. Mm -hmm. Maybe there is some kind of an incentive package that goes above and beyond that says a special permit may allow under certain circumstances, like you're saying, to go over parking for a certain proportion of the parking. Because you could do an L-shaped building then. Mm -hmm. If you could cover some of the first bay of parking that's uh, in your 60 foot, you could actually make an L that goes back, and you wouldn't be credited with that with that parking garage. Which, which anyway, so some thoughts for the future. I, mean, I, I guess I, what I, am I hearing you say that you don't think we should require a step back after the third floor? I'm worried about it. I'm I was thinking when I read it that it should be set back five feet for 50%, a minimum of 50% or something. Because you're concerned about the loss of the floor area. I am. I like the setback. But I'm worried about people trying to build buildings and then setting the, the most valuable floor back, or the, the two most valuable floors. So, I, so I, I'm, I'm, I'm kind I, of deferring to you. Sure. I don't know if you May I address this? Because I, I think these are all very good questions. It's all dialogue. We are right. talking here and there's nothing. No. Oh, wait. I don't know if that's the right kind of marker for the board. So what we're really talking about here is a dimension of five feet across a building that's 15, 10, 10, 10, you know, 45 feet tall. And we actually think in our experience that five feet does visually diminish the overall impression of the height of the building from the primary street. Although it's not that much dimension, and you're right, Ken, you can only get a table and chairs out there, but it's a balcony. It's a balcony. Ten feet would actually be right here. Okay, so that would be a ten-foot setback on this building that's just a general prototype that's supposed to represent probably a hundred different properties along one of these corridors, which is very difficult to determine. But if that were ten feet, uh, yes, 
It's a bigger terrace, but it's actually now more difficult to get a double loaded corridor in that dimension because you've got you've got a corridor here that's serving both units on either side. I mean, Andy, you know this. So it actually makes it a little bit more difficult to program the apartments or office that would be fronting the primary street. So our, and this is just our recommendation, we know that this is going to take a while to pan out, but if there is a five foot setback, if this is the street, with the ground floor, a five foot setback actually achieves the, the tension that people feel that it's too big of a building. And if it is actually here, well that, that makes a very, very big difference in how you perceive that building from the street. Actually people will think, that's too big for Arlington. We disagree. We think four stories is actually about appropriate <laughs> for many of these corridors. If, if there is a modest setback of five, if it's ten, you know, even better, I think, from an urban design standpoint, but it begins to make this unit a little bit more difficult to program. So what, what our initial suggestion to Ted and Laura and her team was that maybe it's a ten-foot dimension over the course of a five-story building, and within that dimension, while well, a developer might be incentivized to do certain things, there's greater bicycle parking, there's more transparency on the ground floor, there's better materials. I think that is a dialogue that's worth having because I think you need carrots and you need sticks and you definitely need clarity. So we are in the weeds, but I, I'm actually glad that we are because this matters a lot in how people perceive height and density and shadows and and you're right, it's not just on the primary corridor. If, if this is a house next door in the back of the street, boy, they care a lot about what that setback is. So to answer the question, I think our, it's our, in our judgment, five feet after the third floor will diminish the height of the building. That's the first thing. If it's five stories, we think it needs to be 10 feet. Now the question is, is it continuous? Well, interestingly enough, when, you know, as Brian was developing these, he didn't assume that it was continuous because you actually don't want miles long of Broadway or Mass Ave to look exact, to have the exact same profile. So to have some play back and forth. Oh my God. That comes off, this just needs to, yeah. We need some liquid. Uh, you don't want it to be, you don't want a ziggurat form along the entire length. You actually want some variation. That's a good thing. If you if you set back more in that case, maybe you're allowed to put a fill out the corner or something like that to give you a little flexibility with that setback. Yes, makes sense. That's a thought. And we haven't even gotten to talk about incentives, but I think that's a, a good mechanism to achieve what you're trying to achieve. I think incentives is you know, a way to uh, talk to or encourage uh, this type of uh, change we're trying to do here. I just want to address that one part. Mm -hmm. I think and he's correct. It's five feet or ten feet. It's, it's already affecting the unit already. Mm -hmm. A double loaded corner, you're saying it's what, 62 feet? Uh, the building's very between like 55 and 65 feet. Let's say it's 60 feet, just for sake sure. of argument. Okay? You got five feet for the hallway, let's say. No. Five, five, uh, five, let's say six feet, because you, you got the, uh, eight, the walls. Eight to ten, okay? yeah. Okay, and then, and then, well, let's say, uh, I've done a lot. I would, I'll say six, okay? Because the five and quarters is pretty much what you're going to go with if, if it's going to be developer. Uh, it leaves you roughly, um, let's say, yeah, like 23 and a half feet, 24 feet roughly on each side. Yes, so then you've got a kitchen that's going to be seven feet, eight feet. That, that leaves you from the kitchen to the outside wall, which is usually living diamond. Right. But if you bring that back five feet, that makes the all it makes is the living dining a little smaller. But if you bring it back ten feet, you offset the living dining. Yeah. This is, I think this is too abstract of a conversation actually. No, I'm, but I'm saying we're assuming a dimension that's very variable across the, right. the length of the corridor. But in, in theory, you're right. What we're trying to do is find a sweet spot that doesn't mandate a particular profile, which is not appropriate for a historic town, across the entire corridor. Uh, and it, in fact, the, the depths of these dimensions are just, they're too varied along the width. It's just a coincidence that this is 120 feet deep, and you're right, there's many ones that are less deep. Do we, can we take an average, or, 
I mean, it ain't that many properties up and down Mass Ave, right? I mean, well, we could develop, we could find an average width, and, average dimensional sizes. That might be a good thing just to start off with understanding what that average is, mm -hmm. um, or or the range. Yeah, the average square footage is about ten, eleven thousand square feet, but the actual dimensions are not good from that. <coughs> There's nothing else from the board. The one, the one thing I'll say, sorry, just to, but I'm actually kind of coming around. I think just because. Now I'm thinking that putting, given our timeline here, what we're trying to do, I think trying to figure out all incentives and you know what would be the right thing without first trying to get kind of the dimensions right and what we what we want to present. I, I guess I get concerned about losing losing our uh, taking our eye off the ball of of the mixed use and entirely if we start saying okay, well if we do this, then you get a little bit more you know, um, affordable, uh, affordable housing or something like that. I mean, I think at some point we have to rely on our inclusionary zoning and that type of thing. So I think maybe on this go around, figuring out what dimensionally we want to do on mixed use, just without thinking too much about the in, uh, incentives might be the right call, but that's all I was going to say. Okay. I'm going to open it up for uh, <coughs> question and answer period. This isn't a public hearing. It's fairly informal, but I'd still ask that as I call on you, you state your name and address for the minutes. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Chris Loretti, um, a couple of comments, questions. Um, first, has, have you taken account of how many lots on Broadway actually conform to this example, um, in these dimensions? I think that's a very unusual situation, that, that there's less than a handful of lots that would qualify. Why, because the, the size? Yeah, you don't find lots that shape that are available on Broadway unless you piece together existing lots. Well, I we know there are some. There might be one or two, but I don't think there are very many. Uh, I guess the other thing, uh, a couple other things I would know that you, in the proposal, you know, and I like the fact that you've added the height buffer zones in that, 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 that makes them a lot more palatable in other ways. But you've also, and I think this was in there before, um, have this kind of strange discontinuity in the floor area ratio requirements based on the lot size. Yes. And um, frankly, if I was a developer and I had a lot of 22,000 square feet, I'm going to lose that 2,000 square feet as, as, as quickly as I can. And um, that just seems a bit strange to me. You know, you've, you've got a 50% bonus in the floor area ratio by reducing or having a smaller lot. And I think you need to think about the implications of that. Sure. Okay. Uh, well, given the fact that the average size of the parcels we're looking at along Mass Ave Broadway are about, as I said, 10, 11,000 square feet. And uh, under an earlier iteration back in 2012 of mixed use zoning amendments, there was concern about uh, large FAR increases for large parcels in business and industrial zones. We thought that the 20,000 square foot limit was um, a good media, a good trade-off so that you wouldn't uh, get, uh, you wouldn't raise concerns about overly large development of large parcels, but you would provide, a, um, you would encourage mixed use development on most of the types of parcels that you see along Mass Ave and Broadway. So it is you know, just a kind of a balancing act thing that we're doing right now, but that was the end. I guess the other thing I um, am a bit surprised at, you know, one of the things that came out in the master plan was the way the current zoning works um, with having a lot of um, less intensely zoned parcels intermixed with more intensely zoned parcels. And I'm surprised to see, as far as I know, that there's not any proposals to upzone some of those parcels, particularly those that are in the kind of core business areas. Um. We have every intention that is the next priority. We just couldn't handle more than this this year. We are doing, we try, we just tried to pick the most important things. We want to recodify. We want to change the zoning map. We want to deal with historic properties. We're doing a housing plan. We, you know, but we just couldn't do more than this right now. That is a very high priority for us to rezone. And I'm wondering, can you do them separately? Um, and I'm wondering if for some of the smaller, or, or less intensely developed zoning districts, are you pushing um, 
you know, pushing because you know those are interspersed within the more intensely developed districts as they are now. <coughs> I'm almost wondering if it shouldn't all be done at one time, but you know, that's a decision that we'll have to make. Um, just a couple other other points. Then. I think you know, the master plan is wonderful because everyone can read into it what they want to. And one of the things um, I think that's worth looking at is the visual survey where people express what their preference is. Um, now, my own reading of it is when you start to look at the different heights of the buildings um, in the commercial areas, people are really happy with three stories. Most people are happy with four stories. Most people are not happy with five stories. Um, and you know, that's my spin on it. I, I encourage you to take a look at the master plan and see if you, know, see if you agree with that. Um, and, and in terms of affordability, I you know, have to wonder, in, in this type of example, um, one, I suspect we're still talking about rentals as opposed to condos at this point. Uh, and my guess is you're not going to get more than one affordable unit in those. Um, there actually is a incentive in the zoning bylaw now for promoting affordability. To my knowledge, it has never been used. Um, but essentially, I think we need to be honest about what, what we're creating here. And it's going to be very expensive commercial or market rate units, and then one affordable unit. And then on the ground floor, you'll have commercial, and it will be um, chain stores. You'll get Dunkin' Donuts. You'll get other, you know, national, maybe, maybe a Starbucks, because they're the ones that can afford the high prices that new development requires. And that's what you see in, you know, on, uh, in North Cambridge, where you've got the Dunkin' Donuts and one of these four or five story uh, buildings. And I think we just need to be, we can talk about coffee shops and everything else, but I think we, you know, we, People need to have a very clear eye of what's going to be going in here. The other thing you see, and there's a building like this in Teal Square in Somerville, is that the grounds, the commercial space on the first floor is just vacant for, I would say, literally years. They finally get some, you know, health, health club chain in there. Um, but, you know, it's, this all looks great, you know, when you do this kind of planning. But I think you need to think very carefully about it and also what you're displacing because a lot of the charming small shops and things are the ones that like the low rents of the existing properties. Thanks. Thank you. Other comments, questions? Uh, Bob Bowes. <clears throat> I had a curiosity question. It was stated earlier that uh, this is not a new concept that exists in East Arlington, the center and the Heights. But I'm curious if this bylaw will any way address existing properties. Those units that exist today are relatively substandard. Uh, they were built years ago. They're they have no elevators, they're small spaces, small closet spaces. If a developer or owner wanted to go in and dramatically change those units, I'm wondering if this bylaw, if there's anything that would address that. Most of those properties have zero parking. So we already have existing retail, we already have existing residential. But if they do more than a 50% improvement, they've got to adopt new zoning or comply with new zoning. I'm not sure how this will help them, Mark. Can that be considered a way of helping them? Well, they actually could come in with no parking for a special permit, and especially if they could provide some parking. They're near the uh, rest of one of the public lots or something. But, I mean, we have set this up to be as flexible as it possibly could be for parking. You, you really could come in with no parking if the board felt <coughs> like it, it was possible. That's a, that's, a, that's a question to you, sir. When you say an existing building and someone's going to come in and renovate the existing building, right? Right. But are they increasing the footprint or, or changing the use or are they just fixing the building? Well, if you were to take the Capitol um, Theater building, commercial first floor, mm -hmm. two floors, I think of three, three floors of residential. Yeah. Um, if someone could go in there and not change the footprint, but totally got the upper floors, build nice apartments. Okay. By doing more than 50% renovation, I think they have to comply with current new zoning regulations. I don't believe so, sir. Yeah, really? No, I don't believe so. But I, I'm no expert here. I'm just saying, usually when you do renovations, uh, what you're saying is greater than 50%, you have to meet the new codes. Sprinkler systems, fire alarm systems, that kind of stuff. There. Yeah, there you go. Yes, but I don't believe zoning. The zoning is massing in size and scale, and you're not changing that. 
But I was under the impression that the renovation costs exceeded 50% of the value of the building if you had to comply it to, to then current zoning. We can check into that. I think, I think none of us know is the answer. Right. <laughs> But, that, but that's important. That's that's something we'd love to see, right? We want to see absolutely, yeah. You know, existing buildings repurposed, changed, and that's a huge part of this idea. Because you have to say, why haven't they been approved after all of these years? There must be a reason for that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's money. Yeah. It's simple as that. But it's worth finding out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I will find out. Yes. Hi, Jill Myrak, uh, eleven. 67 Mass Ave. Um, a question about industrial zoning. You don't sort of talk too much about that in these changes, and I'm wondering whether um, mixed use would apply to industrial, and is there any possibility of mixing residential into the mixed use in an industrial zoned area? Yeah. Uh, that is, we've been asked a number of questions about that. Uh, there's been, during the master plan process, we had people who were advocating for not allowing residential in industrial zones like there is now keeping the bylaw that way. Other people advocating for just certain types of residential in industrial zones like artist lofts or affordable housing. Um, other people recommended treating industrial zones as mixed-use districts and having um, no restrictions on residential in those areas. Um, I think for right now, um, we have a number of different types of industrial districts in town, and some of them are amenable to having residential in them, and some of them aren't, and some of them have industrial service type uses that a lot of people in town want to preserve, and if we allowed residential uses in them, in those zones, they would be rapidly replaced um, by mainly residential development. So I think for the purposes of this set of zoning amendments, we keep a pretty tight control of residential uses in, mix, in industrial zoning districts. But that doesn't mean down the, in the future as we recodify and redo some of the zoning districts and the boundaries of the zoning districts, we uh, might not change the industrial zoning to allow, in certain circumstances, residential in industrial districts. And, and that would be on a sort of case by case basis. Uh, or would it apply across the board? Uh, we would have to, if we change the zoning, it would apply to everyone. So a couple things, a couple of ideas we tossed around but did not propose for this this round were to have two different kinds of industrial zones, an I-1 and an I-2, say for instance, and one would be, one would allow some residential, like maybe along the brook, we would want to allow some residential, um, both to incentivize development along the brook and also because the brook could be a really nice place to live. Um, but, and, but maybe keep some other zones only for industrial. That's one thought. Another would be to um, have it, if you're along, right along Mass Ave, or Broadway to make those allow, to change the zone so that we would allow mixed use there. But we didn't do that in this, this year. And we really, we did hear a, a lot of people say they didn't want to lose what um, little industry we had here. So we want to do that very carefully. So we are considering it, uh, but we're, we're investing a lot of time into the, the question. So for this round, we don't really address residential and industrial, but we are looking to that down the road, the future changes. Don't you have you have it as mixed use? Yeah, but it, without residential. Without, without residential. Without residential. Without residential. <coughs> That's what it says. In the yeah, the, the idea was not to be very careful. We don't lose what little we have, but I think it makes so much sense on those larger lots mm -hmm. to be able to incorporate residential in with it. It's a balance. Yeah. Yeah. So I think that's a really good point that we have to look toward that. Yes. That they were, you know, happening. But we're just, just worried about having it completely go away. The industrial uses which are part of a mixed use environment. I think that's what happened yeah. in the strategy. But it, it, it 
does make sense, I mean, particularly these larger sites that could be wonderful mixes of office, residential, some industrial, right. like has already happened in a way mm -hmm. around 22 mil if you count in the medical office building and Shaddix and all that. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd like to hear how that would be played out in the future. So is that something that would happen eventually or is it on a case-by-case -case basis? Or? Not case by case. I mean, it, it, <coughs> we, we could address it next year. We could say that we'll put it on next. Okay. We'll put it in the list. Got it. I think just tonight I committed to do three things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Mr. Chairman, I was going to say it could be on a case by case basis by the owner, you know, putting it before well, town meeting. Right. Much yeah. the, right. the Brigham site, the Brigham site was industrial years ago. Yes, yeah, so it was. And, then it, and it was rezoned to uh, commercial. And then it became residential. Right. I, I think that is what that is what and if, and if it's already owned, why couldn't they come? Sorry. I'm sorry, yeah, Pam Hallett, Housing Corporation of Arlington. Um, if it was already owned parcel, uh, couldn't they request that it be changed because they, the, the owner, wanted to go ahead and redevelop it? Perhaps change, change the zoning. Yeah. Yeah. Change the zoning. Yes. Right. Yeah, you can always do that. No, yeah. to tell me. To tell me. Yeah. Spot zoning. Spot zoning. Yeah. Well, not necessarily. It would be contiguous with something else. Um, I, I have another question. Um, the unit sizes that you put up there were very small. Um, we've had lots of complaints about small units. Our units are not small, but um, where particularly like 360 and the affordable units at Brigham's, uh, where someone can't even fit a queen size bed in the bedroom and still be able to stand and open their closet and take things out. Um, so I think you need to be careful about you, what you propose or you sort of focus it down on essentially people that would use single beds. Uh, most of the elderly residents that we provide free uh, beds for in their units, they can't fit in a single bed. Uh, they need at least a double and prefer uh, a queen size even though they sleep by themselves uh, because they tend to roll and fall out and things like that. Um, so I think you need to be very careful about proposing a one bedroom at <coughs> 675. In 202s, which are HUD elderly housing, 650 is the size that they typically do and those units are tiny. I've told them that they're really tiny. Um, so I think you need, when you look at that, I think you need to be very careful about what you're proposing, because otherwise you end up with extraordinarily tiny units, which <coughs> a lot of people aren't even going to be interested in renting. Ne it doesn't matter how affordable or how expensive. Can I go ahead? Uh, can I mean, how, uh, um, I think the square footage they show is spot on. I think uh, they might be a little bit on a large side in a few areas, but. I think it's uh, I think it's fairly accurate of what's marked right now, as far as square footages, <coughs> and from those square footages, I've seen units where um, the major bath, the major bedroom, fits a queen comfortably. I mean, the, you're not looking at these big houses. We're looking at uh, more compact living, and I I, I, I would say that I, I I disagree with you as far as um, what you think. I think that is a fairly uh, representation of what market uh, units are, and there's enough space there, and people are renting them. People uh, do like those spaces. Um, I think people are um, living uh, more compact nowadays, living smaller nowadays, and they have less stuff, <coughs> less, less baggage with them in all aspects, uh, senior, the millennials, you know, the, I call them sippy cuppers, um, you know, they, they don't have as much, and I think the, um, making it at that size makes it more affordable <coughs> for people to uh, actually get into it and, and actually have a space they can call their own. Yeah. Well, I, I disagree with you. I've done, I've done a lot of development, and 650, 675 is very small for one bedroom. Okay. Ralph. Uh, Ralph Homer, um, one of the uh, members of the Mass Plan Implementation Committee. I think it's important to note that. I mean, I think that was just an illustrative example of what could happen on a uh, typically sized lot, but the zoning itself 
will not dictate the size mm -hmm. of any of the units. The developers of any particular parcel will decide based on market or whatever other considerations what the size of the unit is, but the zoning and, and nothing in what's proposed here um, specifically delineates how big or small a unit would be. I understand that, but a developer is going to look at how many units they can fit that will be marketable and what they can then charge for that rent that will make it a, a building that works. And all of that takes into consideration what the square unit is in the unit. So just be aware that if you go ahead and assume that everything can be downsized, you're going to be changing the market here in Arlington. And uh, I don't know what that will do to the rentability of the units and the vacancy rate. Uh, Cynthia Campbell Basso, 290 Mass Ave. I was just going to reiterate what Ken said. Um, we have a bunch of smaller one beds and that fly right off the market. They're around 550 to 650 square feet. We have a few larger one beds that are around 900 to 1,000 square feet. People, some feedback we've gotten, some people walk in and say, this is too big, I don't have enough furniture for this. So I don't think, and I think that having small bedrooms that don't accommodate the beds, that's just bad design because you can make bedrooms, you know, our six, some of our 600 square feet um, one beds can accommodate kings when, and you can open the closet and the doors and have a nightstand and walk around. So it's just the design of the layout. But the smaller the one beds, I feel like they're more popular. Other comments, questions, concerns? This will be further discussed uh, at a public hearing on March 7th where <clears throat> still workshopping these to some degree with staff and with the MPIC. And I would encourage everyone to be there. Just a clarification, Jimmy. What, what actually went into the warrant? Is it this detailed version, or did you have something more general on mixed use? Stuff? There's a general uh, mixed use warrant that's been inserted. Uh, it was discussed at the meeting. Yeah, was, was it actually handed out? Uh, you know what? I didn't bring it. I'm sorry. Um, I didn't bring it. That's what was discussed at the last meeting. Um, I, I, can, I can make it available to anyone who wants to see it tomorrow. I'll send it to you. Let me know. Or email me tomorrow and I'll send it to you. I meant to bring a bunch, but I did not. Was it what was emailed out? No, the warrant article. That language yeah, in the warrant the article. article. Uh, the old version. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> well, it's well, it's different. It changed. Yep, it changed. Yeah. The staff will make that available. Yeah, so yeah, slide. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. But. Just to reiterate, there'll be a public hearing after these are, are workshopped and, uh... Is the date set? March 7th. 7th. March 7th. Uh, location to be determined. Uh, it's going to be in the senior center upstairs, okay. so yeah. we can have a little more room. Good, I think we're going to be That's good. So, uh, moving on to parking. Um, oh. A little large. Uh, the parking, as proposed, is um, the, the big change being proposed is to allow by special permit a reduction in the parking requirement, and it, it's not specified how much. Um, as long as there's transportation demand management. So a plan would need to be um, developed and implemented that would encourage people to not use, to not need a car, to not have a car to use transit, to use biking, to use any um, alternative methods that would help to reduce the amount of parking required. And the reason for doing that is that it, it just, it allows more, more development, more residential and commercial development on the lot if you don't have to use the whole lot for parking. And we think that most developers, have, if they can, will provide some parking, but there are, uh, um, there are properties that along this end that just have no parking and we don't want to preclude their development. So we want to try to be as flexible as we possibly can. Everything will come before the board for a special permit so you'll get a chance to, to exercise your judgment on um, whether the parking is the parking plan is adequate. Joe, did you want to say? Um, I, I think that you know mostly what I what I said earlier about you know the the, you know, the, like I said, the history of successful TDM. I think there's a lot of places, both you know, in more urban areas, but also you know, towns like Arlington, you know, particularly in denser 
commercial corridors where these types of measures have been successful. And as Laura said, you know, the fact that there'll be, you know, we're not, this is a special permit process means that there's an opportunity to make sure that the developers are making a, you know, substantive commitment to, you know, those alternative modes and promoting them, what, whatever they might be, and also to make sure it's contextual and makes sense in the location that, that they're actually pro pro that they're proposing to develop in. Um, and I think, as I said earlier, it, you know, the, in response to Ken's question, I think, you know, providing shared parking or allowing parking requirements to be met in a municipal lot or some other lot that they have an agreement with does create the, you know, ability to make de development more affordable uh, or to use the space they have available for more economically or socially productive uses. Which generally, parking is not perceived as a benefit. It's just something you have to provide, you know, whether for the market or for zoning or both. Uh, but this provides a mechanism to, you know, satisfy um, the, those requirements in another way. And I think to also to what Ken said earlier, I think, you know, the, the more certainty that can be provided, the better. So I obviously, you know, the special permit granting process is a risk in and of itself, but hopefully over time you sort of develop a body of, you know, almost jurisprudence to say, okay, this is how this can work and this is what has worked well in the past. So I think over time, you know, this hopefully transitions into a, maybe not, never away from a, special permit, but at least into a set of, you know, guidelines or, or, or kind of known uh, process to, to get to a point where everybody, where the developers feel like they're not sort of walking into a, you know, unknown when they, when they enter into this process. Um, but again, I think it, you know, it, it, it meets the, helps to meet the mixed use requirements, but also has benefit in and of itself, and it certainly goes along with the types of input we heard, you know, fairly consistently throughout the master plan okay. in development process. Thanks. Uh, just one question. I, th I think we are still limiting ourselves to no less than 50% of that required, right? No. No? That came out. Oh, that came? Okay. One thing we're looking at. 126. 126, right? Well, I got one. This is 128. So that, that was a new package? Yeah. Oh, okay. Um, okay, so that one line yeah. came out? Okay. Yes, I'm sorry. Okay, just the, one, the parenthetical? Yes, exactly. Yeah, well, that was that was my only question. It's a surprise. Yeah, yeah, this is sorry. something else. Uh, no, we've been changing things. Right no, no, the deadline. Yeah. Uh, I'm okay. Ken, okay. any comment? No, I think uh, pretty much fine with this. Uh, I think um, diminishing the parking requirements is a good thing. Uh, it encourages the use of uh, all the uh, means of transportation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I think that's uh, a good thing. You know. Yeah, it is. Andy? I'll we'll start with the two. Any public comment, question? I was just trying to understand what that clarification was. So, right as it reads now, um, the, a board could say you don't have to have any parking. It doesn't. Okay. Mm -hmm. as, as long as. As, as long as you have the TDM. Yeah. yeah. Offsite parking, I'm sure. I think that's, uh, well, I guess, you know, just a couple points. I, mean, I think that leaves a tremendous amount of uncertainty for the developer, um, because if they want to develop it you know, that doesn't have any parking, uh, it seems to me it's an awful lot of work to go put together a proposal and only to find out they may not get that. Um, and I would question whether going down to zero is, isn't too much, particularly when, you know, for transportation and management plan, you really don't know how effective it's going to be. There are things to encourage people not to drive, but whether they really want to drive, I don't know, you know, until they're actually, you know, thing gets built and it starts operating. So, I don't know, I, I caution you about that. Taking that out of you. Yes? Um, developers kind of know as to gauge what, I mean, you wouldn't put, pop up a five story building and put zero parking spaces because you know they'd be really hard to rent. You need to have to factor in you know, a certain number um, and be realistic. I, I know applicants come in and view apartments and probably one in four, one in five don't need a parking space. So it's a pretty good gauge. Thank you. Other comments? Okay. Thank you. Again, this also will be discussed at the public hearing March 7th, and I would very much encourage everyone to Mr. President, again, um, thank you for your input and for coming tonight. Moving on to schedule of upcoming meetings. Uh, we
discussed <coughs> Thursday night at our meeting the need to meet again on either the 8th or the 29th. Uh, I would suggest that the 29th would suffice. I don't think we need to meet three weeks in a row unless there's some urgent need to do so. Okay, we meet on the 22nd. No, we're not. No. Okay. We had kept the, we kind of kicked this out to tonight. I'm keeping the 8th and the 29th open. Um, the 29th is fine as a refresher prior to the March 7th meeting. I feel like I should be out at a party on February 29th, though. Uh, really, really. Good. Um, Come on, how I many think times do we get to go out on February 29th? Let's, no, keep, it, let's keep it short. Yeah, we'll go, we'll go, uh, go for a period <laughs> afterwards. Just to celebrate. Right. What's the length? Um, February 29th. Um, I think that what we should do is we should meet again on the 8th. Um, and if anybody has any But I did have a question from the last meeting that I thought of as I, uh, before this one. The different dimensional changes that we're making. On residential. residential. Yeah. Am I mistaken, but at some point I thought we were getting closer to what the state yeah. had. We are the, moving from the seven foot three inch standard yeah. to the seven foot standard brings us into compliance with current Massachusetts building code. Was that the only thing that was... Uh, so the three and a half to the four and a half that's, down to three and a half that's is not, not the that's not, the that's not a safe code. Okay. All right. So it was just the seven three to the seven. Okay. 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 That was uh, that's my only question. I was just curious as to because I think we should make that particular one clear yeah. as yes. we talk about it. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't think we did. So. Okay. Anything else? Okay. I'll move to adjourn. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.